All right, so let's get started with the talk today. Uh, my name is Milica Todorovic, uh, and I am currently working at the Department of Applied Physics at Aalto University, but I'm also working at University of Turku, where this summer I will start a professorship in materials engineering. And before we start with the topic today, which is AI and materials science, a little bit about my background, uh, so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, all right, so I uh, studied physics at University College London, uh, and then I moved on to do a material science doctorate at uh, University of Oxford. And that's when I realized that material science is a department and a field that you can also study. So after that, I went to Japan and worked at the National Institute for Material Science. And there I got involved with a lot of uh, very large scale computational material science uh, using the biggest supercomputers in Japan. So when I came back to Spain, I uh, continued using large computers, price resources uh, from the Autonomous University of Madrid, where I was studying more surface science. And I arrived in Finland in 2015 to Aalto University uh, and assessed group in applied physics. Uh, led by Patrick Rinke. And uh, there we started working a lot with AI methods and uh, what you will hear about today. And uh, so this year I'm moving to University of Turku. So I have worked in AI and material science for the past six years, so since 2015. And uh, this was uh, really a big theme of research in the group of Patrick Rinke, where I was. And uh, Patrick is also a leader of FKI Highlight E, AI-driven design of materials in the Finnish Center for AI here in Helsinki. And so together over the years, we've used a lot of AI approaches from kernel methods, various neural networks, multi-fidelity techniques, and Bayesian optimization and active learning, to name a few. We've run uh, two CSE grand challenges to date, mostly in data set curation and active learning. Uh, we've organized three times machine learning and material science workshop in Helsinki. And we're also running a course now already the fourth year, uh, Machine Learning for Material Science. It's a master levels course in, uh, in Aalto University. So I will kind of condense all of this knowledge and, and try to convey it to you today. Uh, so what I really want to point out is the field it has exploded in recent years. Uh, what you're seeing here is a graph of the number of manuscripts published on the topic of machine learning and material science. Uh, taken from Web of Science a few days ago, and you can see that in the last 10 years, the amount of literature in this area has grown 20 times in volume. So it, it's gotten to the point where it's really difficult to track all the developments, but uh, we're, we're still trying to keep up. So what I will do in this talk is first I will introduce you to material science, um, because many of you may not know about this field. And by now we have some established protocols for how we use AI in material science, so I will tell you about this. Then I will cover a lot of AI methods and applications and uh, finish with some latest trends and challenges. I have a few caveats before I start. Uh, so th this field is huge and it will not be possible to cover everything. So for example, I'm not gonna talk about evolutionary algorithms, which have been uh, in use for maybe more than 20, 30 years in computational sciences. So I will cover mostly the, uh, the, the, the methods and the trends from these last 10 years. Um, secondly, I will not be talking much about AI methods. I will mention what they are, but you can look them up. Uh, I will mention how they're used in material science and why we use them. Um, and the third thing is that I wanted to include a lot of literature in these slides because you will get them. Uh, but there's only so much space. So what I've tried to do is not cite the earliest literature, but cite recent reviews, which give you an overview in the field. So if you look up these reviews, you can learn more about the entire research area. Okay, so let's get started uh, on material science. When we talk about material science, what we really mean is technologies. Uh, so what I've got here on this slide is a number of materials technologies that were developed through materials engineering. Uh, and it's easy to forget that this is where they came from. So some of these technologies are incredibly old. So paper and glass have been around for a long time, but they're also still around. Um, PET and plastics were a big development in the 50s and 60s, and everybody was very excited about it, even though nowadays we have them polluting the oceans. So it's not always a, a happy ending. Uh, silicon technologies is something that we all have in our mobile phones, right? So we carry it with us every day in these CPU chips. Uh, silicon is also what powers the solar cells on people's houses um, for renewable technologies. And when it comes to the, the space flight, there is no end of technologies that, that were developed for this from the ultra hard materials, the durable materials needed to send something into space to the to jet propulsion fuel uh, engineered to give enough power for this. So these are all achievements of material science. Uh, now material science is a field that originally grew out from mining and, uh, and metal processing metallurgy. 
But uh, modern material science is much more than this. I mean, it encompasses rubber, uh, polymers, uh, ceramics, many kinds of different fields. And you could say that the modern material science is a blend of chemistry, physics, and engineering. So in materials, chemistry, and physical chemistry, in, in physics, mostly condensed matter physics, and uh, engineering, it has quite a strong component that deals with, with materials. And there are, of course, in all of these disciplines, side fields that are very close to materials research. So, for example, in materials engineering, mechanical and electrical engineering are very strongly correlated. In materials chemistry, there's biochemistry and chemical engineering. And also in materials physics, there are many physics fields that overlap with this. So it's a bit of an ecosystem. And uh, we can safely say these days that computer science is becoming a big part of material science. Now, something that's very complicated about material science is that materials spend many length scales. So materials exist to many length scales and we can engineer them on all of these length scales. So what I'm showing here is a graph that demonstrates these length scales when it comes to materials modeling, so computational material science. And you can see on the x axis that we have from picometers to 10 to the 12 meters to nanometer, na nanometers, micrometers 10 to the 6 millimeters, so all the way up to real world. Um, so on the y-axis are the disciplines that deal with these kinds of modeling. Uh, so on the picometers, we are at the uh, length scale of atoms and electrons, and the modeling here is quantum mechanical and really has to describe all the electronic states in the system. And so it is quantum physics that, that usually deals with these kinds of uh, calculations. Then uh, when we're on the nanometer to micrometer scales, we can just do atomistic modeling. We can just consider atoms themselves and forget about electrons. A lot of chemistry is being modeled like this, although there is a part of quantum chemistry that works with the electronic uh, length scale. Then when we get to micrometer to millimeter structures, we start to talk about microstructures, and here's an electron micrograph that shows these structures, and we can engineer them on this level too. And this is, the, this is mostly the sphere of nanotechnology because you kind of engineer them on the nano level to grow these microstructures. Lastly, there's the micro scale, the macro scale, and this is the scale of devices. So engineering is mostly concerned with the modeling of devices on, on the macro scale. Um, so this kind of demonstrates the complexity of the field uh, and uh, AI is now being applied almost on, across all levels and all length scales. Now, when we applied AI, um, we have to remember what are the research objectives. So the research objectives in general in material science is to optimize materials and solve global societal challenges. So challenges like pollution, renewable energies, sustainability, all of these are solved uh, by material science. So for example, we model um, light absorbing molecules for LED technologies, phase change memory materials for your, uh, your mobile phones. Biofuels can be derived from biological um, materials like cellulose and this uh, hybrid organic and organic solar cells, hybrid perovskites are, are promising really cheap renewable technologies. So what we do is we model all of these materials at an atomistic level and we try to understand how their internal structure correlates with their functional properties. And this is because the overarching aim of all material science is to refine materials and optimize their performance in devices and technologies. So how do we do, do these aims? How do we achieve these aims? So we, we do them by through some concrete objectives. The first objective is to create tools for materials characterization. And, and this has been an objective in experimental and computational material science for centuries. So we need tools to figure out um, how, what, what materials look like and how, how they behave. So with these tools, the first uh, uh, important objective is to understand what is the internal structure of the material. So that is, this is the form that exists in nature. And you, when we talk about computational material science, these are the forms that have the lowest internal energies. They're the most stable in nature. Uh, another important objective after material structure are their functional properties. And these can be different categories. You can have structural properties like hardness, elasticity. You can have electrical properties like uh, conductivity or chargeability, magnetic properties. So which magnetic type is it and permeability and uh, response to different stimuli. So these are spectral responses to light and particles. 
So here is an example of what silicon looks like. Uh, it's just a chunk of rock, but if you look inside it, you can see the atomistic structure. And if you zoom in even closer, you can see this unit cell, which is the smallest important unit that we need to know about for this material. And if we know about this unit cell, we can pretty much know its internal material structure and its functional properties. So I would like to add to, to this list uh, two other um, objectives that have kind of grown more important recently, and that is materials engineering. So you can uh, change the material by doping or alloying to, to tune its functional properties. Um, and materials design, and this concerns coming up with material blends that uh, we have not studied before and, um, and that we don't know about before. So all of these different objectives are something that AI and material science is addressing. Now, data-driven material science has come about because of the evolution of the scientific paradigm. So from centuries ago, we were doing experiments to learn about the natural world. And then a couple of, um, couple of hundred years ago, uh, we, we uh, believed that theoretical models could explain the world around us. Nowadays, it is the supercomputers that are fueling computational research into the materials world. But then um, we realized uh, about 10 to 15 years ago that a lot of groups in the past 30, 40 years have been computing data and, and, and recomputing data sometimes. Uh, this is all published in the literature and sometimes people cannot find it. So there was no one place where all the computational data was stored. Um, and so the idea came about 20 years ago that we should not just recompute, we should put our efforts into storing computed data. And the availability of this computed data then gave rise to a data-driven research, which is now considered the fourth paradigm in material science. Now, all of this came about because of the establishment of materials data infrastructures. And here you can see a nice chart produced by my colleague, Lauri. And on this, uh, on this axis, you can see different materials infrastructures colored by the date at which they were established. And you can see before the 2000s, nothing really happened. And the seminal uh, uh, infrastructure that was established in 2006 was the materials project uh, at Berkeley. And this really led to uh, modern infrastructure thinking. And uh, in years to come, a lot of them popped around around the world in 2000 and, uh, 14, several European infrastructures were also created. And uh, this one, Nomad in Berlin, is something that uh, our group at Alto University was involved in as one of the PIs uh, developing, developing this infrastructure. So the availability of all of this data started us thinking about AI and material science. And after about 10 years of doing this, I can safely say that there is a routine protocol that we now follow with almost all AI investigations in material science, and it is this. Uh, you have to start with a data set. Uh, it could be something that you computed or extracted from literature or comes from a database. And then you have to represent this uh, problem uh, with some kind of digital representation that is machine readable uh, to the AI, right? And then you choose uh, some machine learning method or AI method that you're going to use. And of course, we have to do quality control to verify the accuracy at the end. Uh, so I will talk a lot about the different machine learning methods and their applications. But before that, I would like to talk a little bit about the representation because this grew into a research field of its own. Um, now, a representation is commonly called a descriptor, right? And this is a machine compatible representation of materials. So this is a mathematical object or a data object that we're going to feed into an AI. Uh, and it has to describe the material somehow. Uh, nowadays, we know that all uh, materials descriptors have to satisfy certain norms. So they have to be invariant with respect to materials, rotations, translations, and atom permutations. Because if you do any of these transformations, you just obtain the same material. Um, so materials representations also have to be unique, so no two material can have the same descriptor. It has to be compact, so it has to be descriptive enough, but the smallest data size possible. And it has to be continuous in a sense that if we change the descriptor a little bit, we expect the target or the label to, to change a little bit. Nowadays, there are uh, mostly two different um, descriptor types in use, and that's the structure-based and the attribute-based. And I'm mentioning binary encoding because this came to us from the field of CAM informatics, and this is still used in that field, but not so much in material science. So when it comes to structure-based uh, uh, descriptors, they really encode the physical structures, so the relations between atoms in a material. The attribute-based take basically a long list of 
uh, different materials properties and encode them in a descriptor. And what the binary encoding does in cheminformatics, it takes sub features of the structure and it hashes them into binary vectors and then it concatenates these binary vectors. We don't really like to use them, even though they're very efficient, because they're really difficult to interpret. Um, and we're always looking for interpretability in this field. So what I will do is I will describe now these two different uh, descriptors a little bit more. Uh, Structure-based descriptors, many, 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 many are out there at the moment. Uh, I'm mentioning only two, starting from a simple one to the complex ones. So on the simple side, we have the Kula matrix, right? That's, that's a, a, a descriptor which takes any pair of element in a material and encodes the inverse distances into a matrix. You can, you can literally visualize this matrix, what this looks like. It's, it's relatively simple. And this, this uh, inverse distance description is reminiscent of the Coulomb law. This is why, why we call it the Coulomb matrix. Now, this is a very compact uh, uh, representation and it's very fast to compute. But for materials of different sizes, the, the, the descriptor also varies in size, which is not very convenient. Uh, and often it doesn't have very good accuracy. Nevertheless, the Coulomb matrix introduced by Matthias Trupp is something that is used very, very often for us as a starting point in, in AI for material science. Now, on the complex side, I will show you the many body tensor representation, as shown here uh, on the principle of a water molecule, H2O. So what the many body tensor does is it collects different layers uh, of information about the system, starting from atoms, bonds, and angles, and then it encodes them all into one long vector. Uh, so for example, on the atom side, there's, there's two H's and there's one O, so the peak is a little bit bigger, and we, we always put this uh, broadened peak and, and then encode this representation by discretizing it on an axis. Um, when it comes to bonds, we have one HH bonds, but we have two HO bonds, so this peak is a little bit bigger. And then angles describe groups of three uh, elements at a time or atoms at a time. Um, and so all of this in information is uh, collected and encoded into one very long descriptor. Now, this representation is very powerful and has led to like, really high prediction accuracies with AI. It also is convenient because it's the same size for any materials type, uh, but it is very long and very heavy to compute. And sometimes uh, the computational cost also in AI working with these applications, uh, with this area representation is very high. Uh, and so there are many, many other representations in the field because this is a whole research area designing new representations. Something that's used quite a lot is SOAP and the atom-centered uh, symmetry functions. And if you read this paper here, you will find a lot of, uh, you will find a library where you can, a Python library that generates these different descriptors. So on one end of the scale, we have these structure-based descriptors and on the other, the attribute-based descriptors. So here I'm showing uh, a crystal structure of simple rock salt, sodium chloride. And what we would do with an attribute-based descriptor is uh, note down its composition, the number of elements, the statistics of the elements, the atomic number, the lattice structure type. Then we can encode all kinds of physical, electronic, chemical properties about it, response to stimuli. And so we make long, long lists of all kinds of properties. Many of them come from standard handbooks. Uh, many of them come from repositories. And, and you code them into these long descriptors. Now, these descriptors are only really 100 to 200 elements long. So they're way, way, way smaller than any structural descriptor. And so it is surprising how well these attribute descriptors work. So the group of Chris Wolverton at Northwestern really pioneered this in with Logan Ward. And you can see that uh, here is a, a table showing some reference literature and which kind of attributes they used. Uh, and you, you achieve pretty decent accuracies with this method. Uh, so the problem with this method is how do you know which functional attributes to include? Like which ones are critical to successful or good quality AI models? Uh, and this brings us to the issue of feature engineering. So when we talk about feature engineering, it's mostly thinking about which materials attributes are most descriptive of, of, of a problem, a particular problem or research question you're trying to solve. So what people did uh, in the beginning is use chemical intuition to find the relevant attributes and, and encode them into these descriptors. But we quickly realized that there is a lot of limitations to this. So another thing you can do is use unsupervised learning in the form of principal component analysis to find out structures in your data and figure out which functional properties are most descriptive of your data. 
Uh, you can go further and uh, use sensitivity analysis with GPs to figure out which functional properties change your result the most. So which ones are most critical to something you're trying to engineer. A very sophisticated approach is just to use neural networks in the form of variational autoencoders to, to feed in some descriptors and then condense all of this information with an autoencoder into a latent space that is low dimensional. And uh, hopefully given enough data, the, the autoencoders will capture the most relevant features which will then live in this, is in this uh, latent space. And, and you can use these as your descriptor. Um, but this is very laborious and data intensive. So, so some approaches that are shown to be more practical are CISO and LASSO. And these are kind of uh, regression um, operators and uh, screening and sparsifying operators. And I will show you one example that was done with these. Uh, so our colleagues in Berlin, um, Luca Geringelli, uh, they were trying to do classification of materials into metals and non-metals. And they started with a, a bunch of attributes, not very many physical attributes. And then they used CISO, um, which allowed uh, all kinds of arithmetic operations between these attributes. So subtraction, division, multiplication. And then they used regression to figure out which combination of these attributes produces highest quality learning. And they obtained near 100% classification uh, in the phase space of these two different descriptors. So you can see them on the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, so what's inside these descriptors uh, are just some cell volumes, uh, electronegativity, and ionization potential. So some very, very basic attributes of the system. Um, and only, I think only four different variables came into this. And these strange arithmetic combinations where some things are multiplied and divided uh, show, kind of translate into descriptors that are so descriptive of the data that you can achieve, achieve near 100% classification success. Um, so a few years ago when this came out, there was a lot of head scratching in the conferences. We were wondering why exactly these combinations of properties are so descriptive. And we came up with the conclusion that, that there is just no way to know. I mean, this is completely chemically unintuitive. Uh, what happened is CISO and LASO did their job. Uh, we, screwed, we, we stuck in a lot of descriptors and they simply find the arithmetic combinations that produce the best, the best result. Um, nevertheless, uh, this feature engineering field remains a very active field of research because we are always hoping that by, by using just data science to fit descriptors, we could come up with some fundamental truths that we still didn't uncover yet about our materials. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about representation. As you can say, this is an active field of research and we have our data set. Machine learning methods come from computer science, so this is all well known. Uh, so you would think this is all a job done, uh, but in reality, this is not really how it goes. Frequently, we perform a project on something, we look at the quality of the method and uh, of the, of the uh, result, and often we find the quality is not optimal and then we have to go back and either change different representations or try with different machine learning methods. And so the past 10 years, there's a huge amount of literature on this process. Uh, different people trying to solve different problems in material science, trying with different representations and different machine learning methods. And uh, this has been laborious, but now it's very useful because we have, we have gained an understanding of which methods work well for which problems. Okay, let's get down to applications. Uh, I would say there are three broad categories of applications of AI and material science. The first one is to replace uh, or accelerate calculations. And, and something that we do there is um, machine learned interatomic potentials or training models or input output pairs, right? This is how we then bypass the calculation. Um, when we have these pre-trained models, there's something that we can do forward prediction and inverse prediction, and this helps us do AI-driven material screening. Uh, and uh, last but not least, the major objective is materials optimization and design, and I will cover three different uh, applications here with generative models, active learning, and automated experimentation. So let's start with machine learned interatomic potentials. Now, interatomic potentials are like one of the earliest examples of AI applications in material science. Uh, potentials are functional forms that describe interactions between atoms. And we've had these interatomic potentials for maybe 50, 60 years now. Uh, they're literally mathematical functions where you put in the positions of all the atoms in the system and you get the energy or some property. 
Uh, and especially the energy is very important because we're always looking for internal structure materials and those are the ones with the lowest energy. So it's really important that we have a reliable method to compute energy. Um, now, something we've realized over these 60 years is that there is absolutely no way to squeeze more accuracy out of these interatomic potentials because they're very simple and they depend on a functional form. And this functional form is restricting the accuracy. But with machine learning models, this is no longer true. So what popped up already 15 years ago are interatomic potentials based on neural networks and immediately after them potentials based on Gaussian process regression. Nowadays called GAPS, Gaussian approximation potential. Um, so after these potentials were trained, it really enabled us to do uh, very high level materials research that we couldn't before. So here on the left, you see an example from Jörg Baylor, who pioneered the neural network based potentials. And he's growing a quantum dot, uh, uh, copper dot on, on zinc oxide. Uh, so these, these machine learning trained potentials enabled us to jump an entire length scale in modeling without, using, without losing accuracy, the quantum mechanical accuracy. Uh, so this was the real breakthrough about AI-driven potentials. Uh, from uh, the gap side, we see some work here of Gabor Chani, who was studying the crack propagation in materials. And these are incredibly complex calculations that usually require quantum mechanical treatment, but the gaps were so accurate, so that this uh, color scale shows accuracy of predictions, that they were able to model this process with interatomic potentials. Uh, so these were really huge breakthroughs, um, and uh, here are some recent reviews about this. Uh, they continued to be used uh, still a lot, um, but there are also some problems with these approaches. So the pros are that we can skip a length scale and modeling with quantum mechanical accuracy, uh, and they're very fast. Um, the cons are that uh, you still need to train them on quantum mechanical data. And the accuracy of the potential somehow critically depends on the kind of data you put in the training set. And if you didn't cover some events in the training set, the potentials won't be able to describe these events either. Um, so how to, how to do sampling to, to cover, to properly train these potentials, they're very versatile, is still a matter of research in this area. Another problem here is that you need to retrain them on massive amounts of data for every element pair. Um, and so it's really difficult to, it's easy to use them on systems where you have only one material. So for example, this uh, crack propagation was only one material. And in this example of York Baylor, there were three different materials, three different elements. But when you think, have, think of something like um, uh, high entropy alloys, where you might have five, six different materials or complex interfaces, heterostructures, then these, the, 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 the amount of training required to train these potentials is simply unmanageable. Nevertheless, they're still very much used. Um, because of the computational cost of this, uh, a more practical approach is simply to train an AI model or input-output pairs. And the way this goes is that you get some uh, data set with input-output pairs. So in this case, the input is a structure and the output is a property of a material, typically energy, could be any functional property. And we get these data sets from, usually from repositories or we compute them ourselves. So when you have enough input-output pairs, you can train more or less any AI model. Um, and then after training, this AI model becomes a resource. And this is because you can then give it any previously unseen input and it just instantly predicts the output or the functional property that you had trained it on. Um, so given enough accuracy, the advantage here is that you can put in like billions of different inputs and instantly get billions of outputs. And from these, you can then figure out which properties you want to use and uh, which structures gave you this, right? So you can then use structural, so screening of structures for the desired properties. Um, so this structure to property prediction is what we called forward prediction. And it's relatively straightforward to do. Uh, we're always interested in the mapping some structure to some property. And uh, here are some examples from our group. So we looked at molecular structures and uh, the properties we looked at are the energy levels of electrons in, in the molecules. And this is of course related to the way that they absorb or emit light. So it's a really important functional property. And we trained the kernel ridge regression model on this. And this allowed us to then put in any new molecule and instantly obtain the electronic electronic levels. Then we went a step further and we trained uh, an artificial neural network, the convolutional one actually, to, to map structure, molecule structure to an entire optical spectrum. This is an even more valuable uh, functional property. And it's more difficult to model because this is a full curve. It's not discrete levels like, like before. 
Um, nevertheless, this worked reasonably well. And what was interesting is that Samsung called us up about this because they're always looking for new molecule candidates for the LED television technologies. And uh, they wanted to use the pre-trained model to kind of pre-screen which molecules give them optimal absorption capabilities, or emitting capabilities. Um, now, one thing that Samsung wants and most people want is you want a, to find kind of the structure. You have a, an application that requires an opt optical peak at some wavelength, right? Critical wavelength, right? And that's, that's your functional requirement. And you want to know which structure produced it. Um, so this is what we call, this is property to structure uh, mapping. And this is what we call the inverse prediction uh, problem. Now, inverse prediction problems are really difficult to solve. Um, and people used to cheat for a long time. They used to do uh, forward prediction with high throughput. So they used to do very, very, very many materials. Um, and they mapped, well, they mapped structure to property. And then they looked in the property map and, uh, and they found the right properties they wanted. And then they looked back to see which materials produced this property. Um, but this was really not sustainable in the long term. What we really need to do is uh, find a way to go directly from experimental property to a structure. And the reason why this is difficult is because we are not really, when we map structure to property, what we're doing is we're mapping a descriptor, materials descriptor to a property. So when you go back, you, you have to model, you have to map the property to descriptor only. And then from the descriptor is sometimes difficult to infer like, the material structure. Um, here is an example from uh, work simulating spectra where they did the adsorption coefficient of spectra and they put it through a neural network and they cor correlated it with um, coordination shells of materials of nanoparticles and this allowed them to reconstruct the 3D nanoparticles that they belong to. Um, this is one of the rare examples and, and this example had to be literally engineered to this application. It's not very general. Uh, ideally, we want a much more general solution where at the end of the uh, process after the AI, we have a generative model. And with these AI generative models, they will produce suggestions of structures that we may or may not have known about um, that give the optimal solution. So uh, briefly speaking, uh, generative model field kicked off uh, about five years ago with uh, Alan Asperguzic, and here's a review from them. They started with variational autoencoders because this was a very good way of doing things. Um, and so what, what they did, and I'm showing a lovely graphic from their paper, is they fed in a lot of structures into variational autoencoder, which condensed all these structures into a low dimensional latent space that was property informed. And then they looked into this latent space for the right area that corresponded to the right properties. And then they used a decoder to, de to extract the, the material structures that corresponded to this. Uh, and this worked pretty well. And we were very excited about this a couple of years ago. But then people realized that 90% of these structures could not be synthesized. And this is because either they, are, they do not exist in nature, so their forms are not stable. And there are forms that have more stable uh, structures, but not such good functional properties. Or it's possible that simply we haven't discovered yet the synthesis route that, that leads to synthesizing these structures. So this caused a lot of head scratching in the field and we were wondering, should we live with these generative models where we have to throw away 90% of the recommendations? But then people thought, okay, we could do better. So they tried to do reinforcement learning or generative adversarial networks or GANs to improve these models. And here's an example of how you could use GAN for this. So you, you have to have a generator that will uh, generate your synthetic data, so your possible molecules. And then you have a discriminator network, um, which has been trained on realistic materials data and is somehow aware of what is possible to synthesize and what isn't. And then the two would compete and the discriminator would weed out the unrealistic data and hopefully uh, allow only the synthesizable materials to, to get through. But this remains a huge field of research. We really don't know yet how to solve these problems very well. Now, all of these applications I've just mentioned, they work with very large data, so they're big data applications. Uh, but this is not always possible because uh, some of our data acquisitions are very costly. So this brings us to active learning and Bayesian optimization, which are strategies for complex optimization uh, in an automated way without any human involvement. Um, so Bayesian optimization is also a very powerful tool to search for global minima of properties. And because we're always looking for global minima of a, a materials energy, so this gives us a stable form for nature, 
we jumped on this method and we created this BOSS uh, technique where we paired Bayesian optimization with total energy simulations that we run on the high performance supercomputers. And, um, and we paired it with materials building blocks. And this is now called a Bayesian optimization structure search. So that this is a code that we created that we run on the CSC commonly. Uh, really, this is just uh, an active learning tool for global phase space uh, exploration and uh, the phase space we're exploring is how materials interact. Uh, and as I said, Bayesian optimization is very efficient at inferring extrema, minima and maxima of black box functions. So here's an example how we use BOSS with active learning. So BOSS is doing all this work. So on the left hand side, it's just sampling different materials orientations and uh, configurations. This is a buckyball on, on a substrate of anatase, both technological materials in uh, solar cells. And uh, the AI is sampling a lot of different configurations looking for the optimal absorption configuration. So as it's sampling, it's building a model and from it on the right hand side, you see a prediction um, of what is the global energy structure. And it doesn't really need to see that many structures before it realizes what is the optimal solution. So this is a really powerful tool. And then we thought it's so uh, data efficient. Uh, we could perhaps employ it on experiments. Now, Bayesian optimization is so data efficient because it relies on Gaussian process regression. And Gaussian process uh, objects are great uh, interpolators. So they don't need a lot of data to, to represent a functional form. So the way we imagine this working is tuning the processing conditions for an optimal outcome. So essentially replacing the experiment, like we before tried to replace the calculation. Uh, and we worked on this with tannic acid crystals, which are bio-derived materials with our colleagues in the FinCetis Center of Excellence. And they were making particles of this material and we wanted to see if we can use AI to drive it from 1D to 3D. So what they did is they used this biomaterial in a solution and they varied pH and pKa of the solution. So basically the strength of processing and that helped them synthesize some particles where they tried to measure the dimensions. We converted this into morphology data. We put this in the GPR with BOSS and we obtained some kind of visualization of what a functional property might look like in the phase space of pH and pKa. And this is a morphology map for the particles. And in the top right, we have 1D particles. And in the bottom left, we have 3D particles. And this is a purely data-driven model, not related to scientific intuition at all. But if you then cross-reference this to their, uh, to their experimental images, this is really what, what we obtained. So the, the 1D particles in the top left and the 3D particles in top right. And this can now give recommendations for how people should use um, uh, the chemical conditions, how they can vary it to engineer the desired outcome for their applications. So uh, it's, it's uh, kind of catching on now in the community that uh, Bayesian optimization and active learning is good for guiding experiments because it helps to retrieve uh, really informative data. So you don't have to take too many data points or you don't have to do too many experiments. You can only do the ones that are most useful to build an accurate AI model. Um, so this was pioneered by the group of Tura Lukman in 2016 already, and I'm showing an image here from their, directly from their manuscript uh, because it illustrates the process. So they did some experiments and then they, uh, they tried a couple of com uh, compositions. They extracted some features. This is the descriptor part. The inference is the machine learning part. And then after that came the acquisition function in active learning, which helped them uh, do the design or infer which material combinations to try next. And then they did experiments and they updated the data and, and that, is, that is it. So what they were looking for is um, shape memory alloys based on nickel titanium, um, which have a small hysteresis temperature. And this is related to material fatigue after a lot of um, cycles of changing the, sh the, the, the shape of the, of the alloy. Um, so the smaller this delta T, uh, the less fatigue you get over time, so the better shape memory material you get. And the optimal solution they found was this. So it was mostly titanium nickel with a little bit of copper, iron, and palladium thrown in. Now, if you look at these compositions, this solution is a needle in a haystack, this material. I mean, you could never get this with a chemical intuition. Um, but the AI got it, or at least the AI told them to try it. Now, they didn't do too many experiments. They did only 36 experiments for this in um, nine different feedback loops. Um, but out of the 36, uh, about 
half of the samples that the AI told them to try produced better delta T temperatures than anything we had known before for this material class. And so this was obviously very efficient already. And these ideas led to uh, the creation of autonomous experimentation tools. Um, and uh, the idea here was to, to basically integrate uh, robotics with experimental instruments so that, that you can automate the entire procedure. And uh, integrating robotics required smart systems knowledge for controlling the robotics and also allowed us to digitalize data immediately as the experiments were being made. Uh, now, in these autonomous experimentation systems, you have usually two parts, the synthesis, which makes the materials, and characterization, which measures some property. And both need to be automated in the setup. Uh, but if you've done so, you can really get high throughput experiments, so you can try many samples, and you can seamlessly integrate the data with AI. So here are some examples in the very last, like recent years. Uh, this is an example of uh, chemical synthesis equipment where they've interfaced it with, with um, digital devices and they, they control different synthesis. The robots can, can, can do the synthesis. This is from Urbana Champagne. And then from uh, Boston, I think we have this characterization system where, where, they can, where they have robotic arms and they can use different kinds of characterization equipment at the same time. Um, now, I have to stress, this is all homemade equipment and nobody knows how to do this well, but more and more uh, kind of publications are coming out on this, so hopefully in the future, many of us will be able to adopt these systems um, in, in the years to come. Which brings us to future developments. So, um, all of these experiments, uh, automated experiments, are hopefully going to bring about a new wave of understanding in experimental data digitalization. Um, we have computation repositories, but we have no repositories for experimental data. And this is partly because experimental data is so uh, inhomogeneous and comes in so many different formats. It's really difficult to encode it in, in some recommended way. But we must do it in order to move forward. Instead, experimental data is mostly published in literature and papers, and uh, this has not been exploited almost at all up until now. So there's a big trend coming of natural language processing applications on scientific literature in the materials domain. Um, as I mentioned before, inverse prediction problems have not been solved very well in generative models. We have to work on that. And there's now a big coming trend on multi-fidelity and transfer learning data. And multi-fidelity is really learning from cheap and approximate models and then refining the model with more accurate model. And this is very topical in materials research because we have a lot of approximate models. The entire computational material science is an approximation for an experiment. And there are all these interatomic potential models that are approximates for full quantum mechanical treatment. Um, so this is a very promising, promising idea. Personally, I think what we'll end up with in the next five to 10 years are complex models where we have layered bits of information that come from different sources. So something that's happening a lot now is uh, there's uh, people trying to build AI models based on uh, chemical intuition. So sampling the domain knowledge of the researcher and building this into a physics informed model. So this kind of intuition encoding um, is one layer. You can have another layer from natural language processing of literature. And of course, there are the data models which we have right now. And hopefully we can, uh, in the future, stack them up all together and produce frameworks to seamlessly exchange information between them. And this will help us to generate new knowledge that could not come from any layer alone. Uh, when it comes to a wish list for AI and material science, um, we mostly need methods that are data efficient because in, in material science acquisitions are generally costly, experiments are particularly costly, but then calculations also are. And while we use the CSE quite a lot, we, we don't really want to uh, make this process not sustainable. Um, it's important that the AI be interpretable because we are using it to, to model natural processes and they have to reflect that. Um, multitask, I've already mentioned, it's very useful learning for approximate models. And another thing that I haven't mentioned before is that every time we characterize a material, we would ideally like to know just not what, just one property, but many properties at the same time, right? Um, so this is what I call multifaceted data. So from every data point, you have multiple labels. And this then facilitates uh, design objectives that are a combination of multiple labels. So you can satisfy multiple design objectives. You can look for materials that are stable in nature, but also has some, have some desired uh, functional property. 
Okay, so this is the end of my talk. I will just summarize quickly that AI is quickly becoming a part of the standard tool set in material science research. Um, we use it for very different applications and research questions from material screening to material design and optimization. Um, it's increasingly being used in experiments, though it's now well established for computation. And something that's very important for AI and material science is education because it is our students uh, who will be trained in these methods and they will be the, the future leaders of uh, trends in this research area. So we have this machine learning for material science course. It's a master levels course at Alta University, uh, open to all of Helsinki region. And it's really important for us that we give our students who have the domain knowledge about material science, also data analytics skills and knowledge about AI and how to use them efficiently. Um, so putting these domain skills with data literacy is something very important for us. Um, okay, before I finish, some quick acknowledgements about the people who really helped to promote this field in Finland. Patrick Rinke started the CEST group at Aalto University in 2014, so not so long ago, but uh, he's been pushing very strongly for AI applications and material science and with, her, with him I learned a lot. Uh, so he's really a pioneer of promoting this field in Finland. And I have to thank our computer science collaborators, Yuka Koren, Deraki Vechteri, and Samuel Kaski, uh, with whom we work on different aspects of AI. And um, I really appreciate that they were willing to engage in dialogue with us because until they got involved, I mean, with their involvement, we were able to go so much further and so much faster into this field. And they still remain uh, good collaborators of us, uh, of ours as well, in FKI. Okay. I'll stop here and take any questions. Thanks for your attention.